and the business is not correlated with outcomes. That I have a huge issue with. And I look at it and say, if you're, if you're going with somebody and they're teaching you doing courses stuff and over 30% of their income comes from doing that, you should be very, very nervous because you are the product. Yeah. And that's 90% of them out there. Yep. You're checking out the Investor Shed podcast with Nick Beveridge and Jeremy Kitchen. They're on the path to financial freedom and they're taking their community with them. Stay tuned for the best free real estate investing advice on the internet. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the best podcast episode we've ever recorded. You landed on it, didn't you, Jeremy? I landed on it. (laughs) This is either the second best, the first best, or anywhere between the one and 64th best, I believe. How many episodes have we done? Uh, If you count the first season, I don't know, 70, maybe? Let's not count that first season, man. (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) But speaking of not counting that first season, we have AJ Osborne on the podcast with us. Nick, I was so stoked to talk to AJ today. He's uh, super cool to talk to. My God, we got a big player on the show. We got a big big player. Big player. A lot of people have heard of AJ Osborne, right? We want to hear from the audience out there. Tell us. Tell us you've heard of him. That was a lot. Did that you was a that? lot. I heard everyone. They're like, yes, yep, 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 yep. <laughs> no, but we got AJ. He's one of the leaders in the self storage industry. Uh, the dude is literally smart as a whip. He's a sixth generation investor with over 10,000 doors, 3 million square feet of self storage. Uh, he owns a ton of companies. Uh, we go into all that and how he vertically scales and just, uh, he's got the, the best story in investing too. Like, like his story was the reason, one of the reasons why I, I wanted to invest and needed to invest. Oh, yeah. And he's coming to town next month. Or I'm sorry, when, when this releases, he'll be coming to town in two weeks. Yep. September 26th to the 29th, self-storage event in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. If you don't have your tickets, please go get those. Link will be in the description. And he's dragging along Pace Morby with him. Who doesn't like hearing him from Pace Morby? <sighs> That's Come what here, he's Pace. doing. He's dragging <laughs> Like breaking him through <laughs> the mud. <laughs> so we don't have a proper introduction on this show. We just get right into it. Hope you enjoy it listen in hold on before you go what kind of food should people be eating in this episode i think they should just be drinking energy drinks non-stop we're talking <laughs> ghosts we're talking bangs we're talking rock stars monsters little bit of red bull bangs and then have some coffee oh i said bangs okay i wasn't listening take it away here we go so when the, when this episode when this episode airs um it'll be september 7th so it's just a couple of weeks away from your event here and most people that listen to this show, they're local. Um, it, we're not a huge show. I've been doing it for about three years. Been doing it more uh, weekly for at least consistently the last year or so. And uh, we don't, ha- I think we've only gotten like 4,000 downloads or so, so far, but we're, we're really going to pump this episode out. So we appreciate you doing it. Well, I appreciate you guys. That's uh, um, actually an impactful episode for me because you guys are local and it's one of our key missions is we're trying to be way more involved and local stuff. I'm a sixth generation Idahoan and most of our investors, everything else comes from all over, but not here. And it's been one of the things that it just never, that's never how it worked or anything else. And we've been trying to change that. So happy to be here and support you guys. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And then real quick, one thing. So I was going through one of your, um, your slideshows that BP con sent us 8,000 plus doors. Is that an accurate number still? Ooh, okay. Perfect. I was going to, Say that probably number jumped up a little bit, 10,000. And then it says, yeah, 2 million square feet was what I saw last. Is it more than that uh, now? 3 million plus. 3 million plus. Got it. Come on, Jeremy. Hey, I'm sorry. I've got dated stats here, okay? <laughs> it's a little old. I like the one that you just did with Brandon Turner. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I've gotten huge feedback from that one, which was interesting because when we went into it, we kind of went through it and we're like, this is a different podcast than we're ever going to do. We've ever done. And, you know, Brandon's a close friend of mine. And so I think that the format allowed, because it was him and me, we could go different and deeper. But I honestly, we got done. I was like, oh, that was fun. It was great talking about those things, everything else. But I did not think that it would be of a lot of interest to people because, I mean, we didn't talk finance or anything until 
like half the time, but that is probably the most feedback I've ever gotten from any podcast, which was interesting. But you guys eventually did talk business and it was great. We did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it was great. Hey, so um, it's funny. Most people that are on bigger pockets, they're usually there because, you know, they have an in or um, they met at a conference or they're in some sort of mastermind together. But you literally like bumped into Brandon Turner on the beach one day with your scooter, right? 100%. <laughs> and you're just like, hey, I, I think I recognize you. Yeah, there was no in, there was no anything else like that. It was just, we were both in Hawaii at the beach at the same time. And and you were just, you were kind of in recovery mode still from, yeah. from the... Uh, I couldn't walk at at the time, which is so funny too, because I give Brandon crap about it because I was on a scooter to get around and um, my legs hardly worked. I was still trying to learn how to walk and everything. And so I'm talking to him on my scooter, right? So I'm just sitting there talking to him, everything else, which is, uh, yeah, I wasn't happy about that. But he's like, hey, dude, well, hop up. Let's take a picture. And I was like, okay. All right. And so I got <laughs> up, hop, hop up and I stepped over and I had my crutches and things like that. And I was like, sit there and we, we, we took a picture, but I was, it was just so funny because it didn't even key to him. And I was like, oh my gosh, it was so painful. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm like, yeah, first time we met, Brandon made me get up as I'm paralyzed. And I just come take a picture with me. <laughs> How about you come down here, buddy? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I can relate with your story so much. Um, I mean, I, I got into real estate about 13 years ago as a real estate agent. And um, a couple of hours before I went to take my real estate exam in Florida, I had a grand mal seizure and kind of woke up yeah, was out of nowhere. I was really young. Um, woke up with kind of paramedics all over me. I was in a daze. Then I wound up in the hospital for a couple of days. And uh, just kind of had to start over from scratch. And at that point in my life, I did not have um, rental income, any kind of income. I was working at Disney World as a uh, Lake Patrol lifeguard guy. And they couldn't have me working there anymore. Guy all of a sudden having seizures. So I got laid off and uh, kind of had to start with from zero, starting a business with, with nothing, not even a car. And uh, it was just kind of incredible to hear your story and how, how much you had to kind of work your way back into the business too. Um, so do you, do you mind getting into a little bit? I, I mean, I feel like you don't have to go in too deep because it's a, it could be a long story, but just catch people up to speed on what happened to you. Yeah, 100%. So um, I was, uh, um, so I became basically a quadriplegic out of the blue. Um, I am, for those listening, I'm, I'm uh, well, I was a lot more, young then, but, uh, early thirties, right. Uh, we just had our fourth child. Um, I was outrageously active. I was running a large brokerage firm here in Boise, Idaho. Um, and I, uh, was also building a a side business and I had four kids now. And, um, I was a big backpacker, fly fisherman, right? All those things I, I, I loved. And I went a thousand miles an hour. And then I was out planting these massive trees after my best friends went, my best friend had a wedding and I was up all night, um, at his wedding with him. And the next morning I'm planting trees. And that night my legs started to really just, they just started to really hurt. At first I thought it was because of the planting trees. Like I thought I just was overexhausted, you know? And, uh, um, I went to get in the bathtub and, um, uh, I, to try to get my legs to start feeling better. And my wife put the kids to bed and I went to get out of the tub and I, my legs didn't work. And so she had to pull me out. We went to the hospital and they spent, I mean, forever. It was like, I don't know, a day or two trying to figure out what was wrong with me. And the paralysis kept getting worse. And then I was put on life support because I stopped or I was put into a coma and then put on the life support because I lost all functionality. And I woke up and I was hooked to tubes. And so um, I was hooked to tubes for um, almost three months. When I finally was able to start to breathe on my own again, um, I was sent to a LTAC, long-term care facility. And when I was uh, finally, I could breathe again 
and everything. I was actually let go from my job in the hospital. Um, and that became my new life. And this was about six years ago. And that uh, lost kind of just everything in one fell swoop. It was just all gone. And we didn't know, you know, what the future would hold or anything else. I, I, I moved over to a rehab facility where I lived and they helped me. And in the rehab facility, um, I was going to be sent home uh, for the first time to do a visit. And it was going to be Christmas morning. And the hospital was going to allow me to do a visit at home. I had gone in, remember, when it was warm, I was out planting trees. And so I'm sitting there that evening, and it's snowing. And I was so excited because I was, of course, going to get go home, but I was going to get to see my, my, my babies open their presents. And I just knew my wife was going to spoil them, right? I was like, oh, you know, it's been such a hard time, everything else. And that's when it just dawned on me. Here I am, paralyzed in a bed and I'm not worried about my wife having to leave the kids to get a job. I'm not worried about losing my home. I'm not worried about all the things that I should be worried about. I was excited to see my kids. I was excited to see them open their presents. And then I was just th uh, concerned about me and how I could get better and what that meant to the kids and things like that. And the reason was due to the fact that we had cash flowing real estate that we had been working tirelessly for a long time to build up and to create a portfolio. And that saved my financial life. And so I, it was then I decided I'm going to made promise I was going to do two things. And that's, I was going to allow others uh, to invest with me because up until that time, I'd never taken on investors ever. Um, it was only me, my dad and my brother-in-law that were a part of this company that had built it. And then the other promise was I was going to teach people. So up until then, I've never done anything like social media, podcasting, nothing like that. That was not my thing. I didn't, <laughs> not, not, yeah, I didn't do anything like that. Um, and so after that, I started a blog and I, I actually started the blog in the hospital and I quickly learned that I am horrible at blogging. Um, and so I was like, that's, that's not my thing. And so then it was just a struggle on how to help and teach other people. And, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time teaching and I don't make money from it. And that is something that I've thought often about just I'm like, oh, maybe I should stop. Or maybe, and I'm like, I can't, cause I made my promise to do it. And so I have a whole team I've hired and everything else. And I had to figure out the best way for me and how to teach. And then also I had to now take on investors. I'd made my promise and I wanted to share that. And we did it totally different than everybody else had done it. And we also did it in a way that nobody else could do it because I like to say that, you know, most people become wealthy from investors where our investors are becoming wealthy off what we had already built and owned. We didn't need that. We didn't have it. And it made it so we could set up some very unique things and uh, very proud of that, you know, but it was also very hard. You can imagine having, cause you gotta, you gotta realize we had like a portfolio of 150 million before we took investors. So to go from that, never dealing with an investor, never having to service people, never having to do with the laws to transition over now to taking investors and having to provide them stuff. To, that was a big learning curve for me. And there were several times that I was like, what am I doing this for? I don't need to. Like, why? Right? And two, we had deals that were, I mean, a lot of people have seen and read about our Idaho Statesman deal, which we took over right on an exit to downtown Boise, and we're turning that into a big facility and stuff. I mean, some of these deals are like once in a lifetime deals that I then couldn't keep to myself. Um, I needed to share and open up, up that to to investors to do right. So uh, it was actually that there was a lot of things I didn't think about, and there was a lot of things that I had to learn and get better at. But you know, that gave me a purpose, and uh, that's what I desperately needed when I got out. Because I don't think I had a purpose. And I got to tell you, I, I, 
I, I would go to work. My brother moved in to live with me, so he's in the army now, but he moved from Hawaii. So he was at school in Hawaii. My brother Trevor called him up and said, Tay, you gotta you gotta get home now. And he's like, Oh, okay, you know what? And he's like, You're driving to the airport and you're coming straight here. Uh, because they didn't know if they were ever like it was come say goodbye kind of thing, you know, they had no idea. So um he dropped everything, came, and then he never left. So he would stay with me every night in the hospital so my wife could go stay with the kids and I wouldn't be left alone because I was still mentally all there. So when I got left alone and things, that was it was pretty traumatic because I was on all these drugs and ICU delirium. Didn't know where I was sometimes because of what was going on. And so he stayed beside me. Then when we went home, he moved in with me. And he came home to help me and my wife take care of the kids and, and uh, you know, everything else. So uh, when I'm, I'm sitting there going, everybody's been serving me. I don't have a purpose. And my brother would take me to the office where I would sit in my wheelchair and I would try to do stuff until I eventually couldn't even do anything anymore. And he had to take me home and I'd be falling asleep or whatever. So it was a way, though, to get me out of the bed. It was a way to get me to do something and take my mind off of everything. So it, that 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 promise that I made, I think, has helped me more than it's probably helped everybody else, which drives me to help them even more. Um, but yeah, that became my defining purpose. Yeah. Another thing, too, that um, I kind of noticed when, when you were telling your story in the past about this, you, you seem to have like a mindset shift a little bit when it came to... Um, caring what people thought of you. Um, and I, I had that, I had that shift too, when I went through my health issues, because I, I had, you know, I was in and out of the hospital for a couple of months, pretty shameful, couldn't pay my bills anymore. And then I had to have people watch me in the shower. <laughs> so I wouldn't fall over. Um, and, and you talk about, you know, you had people bathing you for, for months. And, and I'd lie um, there and they'd roll me over and I'd just lie on my side as they'd wipe me down. And, it shifts things. Prior to my experience, I was super self-conscious and I cared a lot about what people thought of me. And I just started to not give a fuck anymore. Um, and I kind of felt like you had that similar experience and it, it really does help entrepreneurs, I believe. Um, can you, can you talk a little bit about that? hundred percent. I, I think that I, I was probably one of the guys that said, you know, Oh, I don't care what people think of me. Right. You know, but a hundred percent did. Um, in fact, vastly more than other people. And I uh, don't think I realized it. And one of the reasons why, honestly, though, I didn't ever, like, I learned really quick. I, I probably didn't give value and put out a lot of value because of two reasons. First of all, I didn't think I had value to give, which, you know, looking back on it now may seem a little silly. I was running a large business that was a brokerage firm and I'd built this huge portfolio, but I didn't, I didn't believe I had value to give. Uh, and then two, also I was just so, I, I think that that why I didn't think I had value to give was because I was self-conscious about giving it like, Oh, why would anybody care? And it's not that I was like, why would you, why would anybody care about hearing from me? And I might mess up or I might say something stupid and you know, everybody else is smarter than me. So at, at the end of the day, the only reason why, the reason why I wasn't sharing any value that I had was due to that. And uh, I didn't, I think, fully realize it at the time. Um, but I was, I think everyone is. And I think people that say, oh, I don't care what people think are usually the people that care the most. And it, it, it really, well, I didn't realize how much I cared. I didn't realize how much of a thing that was for me that I was holding myself back simply because of what, I was worried other people would think. And I, I don't mean this in like it's, oh, just don't care. That no, it, it's hard. It's not that simple. It, it's very hard. And that could be that could be taken out of context. Uh, what we mean is um, we we don't care what people are going to think about our uh, serving our, our new purpose. And, and we're not going to be hung up by, you know, we're not going to not make calls because we're nervous what people are, you know, rejection, those kind of things. Um, I'm very concerned about what people think that I'm a good person, things like that. Right. I mean, we're still, I, I feel like with successful people, they have three things in common. They're usually self-secure, 
they have self security issues, <laughs> and um, they they have um, gosh, I already forgot the three, but I'm I'm on the spot here. Um, they they have the self security issues. They believe they can do big things, though. They believe that yeah, but they have the they have the um, ability to delay gratification. I forgot the third thing. But um, it's, oh, they, they think they're better than everyone else secretly, but they don't tell anyone. <laughs> that, that, those are the big three things that people have in common, like the, the ultra um, mega successful people out there. Sorry, sorry, I stumbled through that, but. No, you know, and you're 100% right. I think a lot of my insecurities had been driven from when I was little. I was dyslexic and ADHD, and um, I literally felt like I was an idiot. I felt like I was stupid. And that's because at the time, the school system you know, Idaho, early 90s and 80s. Yep, yep. Didn't have any resource. They didn't know what to do with me. And so they got to catch me. And, you know, it's no one, he didn't have to tell me I was stupid to tell me I was stupid every single day in the school system, which I was told. I actually ended up leaving the school system in my freshman year um, of high school. And I ended up going to college when I was 16. Um, and funny enough, I flourished there when I was basically failing out of school. And so I just stopped going. Um, and so I think a lot of those insecurity stuff were, were, were drawn toward, towards then. And I think that, you know, caring about what other people think is a good thing for the right reasons. So I very much care what people think about me as a father, as a husband, as a person of, of integrity. That stuff I super care about and I think about a lot. And one of the reasons that I'm not only just okay with that is because it caring and putting my emphasis on those things actually places me to say, if you do this, does this reflect your intermoral compass and show how you feel and are as a husband, father, things like that, right? That's totally different, right? And I think that you should, people, we end up in a, pro, in, a in a culture where they say, oh, caring what people think is, is, is stupid or bad. So just do whatever you want to whoever or whenever. That is not what we're talking about here, right? Way off. Um, the things that I'm talking about is getting on this podcast and being complete, completely open, right? And being true to myself, and being confident enough to give information out. And I think that, you know, even today, this is something that I really, after got out of the hospital, I'm like, I'm just going to talk. I'm going to hear And, and I, I didn't care. And I didn't, I, I, I'd put information out without critiquing myself or worrying. Cause like, you know, you, you can critique yourself so much, you end up not doing anything. And when I got out of the hospital, I was really good at that that's become harder as I go along. It's been almost six years now and I'm already noticing I'm falling into those traps. Did I say this right? Right? Well, what if somebody disagrees with me? What if somebody doesn't like my position on X? And it's like, what am I doing here? Like, that's not what I've promised myself to do. And I, and I have to remind myself. And we live in a world where you can be on the internet and it's true, you can be crucified. And you got to realize that 50% of the people, no matter what, are going to disagree with you on everything. They're, that You just can't get away with that. So in order to stand up and be true to who you are, while accepting the fact that other people won't agree with you and things, that that is hard in today's age because the impact of it, uh, it, it can be a lot bigger. And I don't want to downplay that at all. Yeah. Let's let's talk about your event real quick, if you don't mind. Um so about about a year and a half ago, Jeremy here invited me to this event in Boise, the CRE event, um, and uh, it we just went for it. Okay, I'll drive down there. I'm a real I'm a uh, real estate seminar junkie. I've been one all my life. I I've been to dozens and dozens. Uh, let's go hear a sales pitch, sure. <laughs> um, so and I usually always learn something. That's why I go. But uh, so Jeremy drug me along, and and I started listening. I I hear your your event. And then I, I start, I'm like, Hey, is this the guy that was on bigger pockets that bought that Kmart? <laughs> I'm like, Oh, this is, that's awesome. Okay. I'm excited to hear the sales pitch. And, uh, day one goes by no sales pitch. Day two, they're catering to us, feeding us, giving us drinks afterwards, hanging out with Brandon Turner, talking about Iron Man, no sales pitch again. Day three, I think there were three days. 
no sales pitch. And I, we went home, driving driving home from Boise to Coeur d'Alene, and we were just fascinated by what we just experienced. Was, this was three of the best real estate in, like seminar days I've ever been to. And I'm just like, dude, what what were they selling? I I uh, I missed it somehow. We got to go again next year. I remember you trying to dive into that. Like, what what yeah. were they selling? How were they giving like, value? What, what happened? What did I miss? Um, it was awesome. I even got this free hat. <laughs> so we went again the next year, expecting full on to be sold something because I must have missed it the first year. Again, what? Why won't you sell anything at your event? What am I missing? And and will you sell something in Coeur d'Alene? Hopefully this coming in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Nick wants to be sold, AJ. So if you could just sell him on something, that'd be great. Can you, can you talk about like, how are you, how are you able, how are you able to put together these events? And I can't imagine you're making money on these events because I've done the math. My maybe I'm first wrong. event cost me 150,000. So when, uh, and that was after everybody paid and dues and everything else like that. And that was my first quarter line event. So let me share with you uh, something. I was a deal junkie too. And I went things. And what I found out was I didn't learn really a whole lot. Um, there's some interviews, but it was, everything was, it was solely created to give that offer and then have a sales pitch in with it. Um, and that goes directly against my whys on why I left the hospital. It, it is to educate people. And I have been, um, it's actually one of my downsides, to be totally honest. And it's not because I'm not selling something. It's because I give so much that sometimes it's overwhelming or it's over people's heads or that because I am like, listen, here is everything. Here's the meat. Here's not a fluff. Here's the meat. And so um, I put these events on and everything. First of all, everything is a sales. Don't every you you are always selling. I am selling because I'm on here. Everything is selling. And that's just a truth of life. Every time you say anything, you are doing it for an intention. There's nothing that anyone ever does for any reason without intention. So when we do it, my whole purpose is to educate people, okay? And to um, have people join me. But I do it in a very different way. I'm not selling you to join me. I say, you're going to come and learn, and I'm going to provide so much value that you're just going to want to be a part of what I'm doing. That's it. And it's yeah, like- and I and I finally figured it out. I, I feel like, and tell me if I'm wrong here, yeah. but I feel like you offer so much damn value out there that people just try to hunt you down after the fact and throw money at your face. Yeah, that's pretty is much it, it. Is that it, what happens? Yeah. It's, I, I don't need to, I don't need to have a sales pitch. I don't need to do anything. It's at the end of the day, you're either going to, uh, you're going to take my information and you're going to do it, which I encourage. I actually want people to do it. And I believe there's monetary reasons for that. So one of the things you look at in self-storage, self-storage was when I got into it, it was a fragmented industry. You're talking like 90% mama pops today. It's only about 50%. And we were so worried about the survival of the industry that we created a a, a store local, a co-op so that all operators could share resources and they could get all this stuff. We could act like a big operator, right? Well, that we wanted to protect individual operators from just big REITs and conglomerates buying up the industry. And then it would end up like the hotels did. Well, that's very intrinsically important to my business because if our business ends up in the hands of four or five, I can't survive I actually need independent operators first to create a fragmented bit business to give me p potential acquisition targets, right? There's 60,000 storage facilities, but if that if we take 60,000 storage facilities and we end up like uh, apartments, which only 10% are mom and pop operators, that means I'm competing over 6,000 storage facilities as potential buy, which that sounds like that's so many you could ever do, but that's with you know, you're talking 6,000, that's with 5,000 other people like me. So it's, it's not, or more 10,000 people like me. So all of a sudden now it, my business model is not even that viable. So when I look at it, I go, I'm, I'm very much extraordinarily bought into protecting my, this industry in the long-term value of it, because it protects myself. We started a software company called Tenant Inc., and Tenant Inc. is a property management software system that has open source. You get your data, you own it, you can use it, you can take it. And we did it because all the other property management software systems trapped operators. And the big boys 
they are big and they're powerful because they have open, they own their own data. They can use it, right? So we didn't have that. So we created a co-op to open it and a property management to open it. So there is an actual incentive for me to have people getting into the business, not allowing the business to be create uh, to be consolidated. I am on a journey to create a multi-billion dollar storage company, right? We have right now somewhere between north of 300 million, depends on how you value it. Yeah, two years uh, or a year ago, it's probably 500 million. Today, it's probably 350 to 400 million uh, just because of how people value it. But I'm trying to get to the multi-billions. I can't do that unless the industry is there. So, you know, I'm very much bought into this long-term value. And then also too, I cannot do that alone. I have to have people help me. So when we, you look at the co-op and the tech company, the more people that use our system, it benefits me. Now it benefits them too, because everybody that uses it, we get higher rankings on Google. So we have better customer acquisitions. We have more data so we can make more information off. So it helps me perform and beat the reads, but it also helps them. So for me, I, that's, like I can actually do this and it is a benefit to you and a benefit to me. And it's a true benefit. Actually, we need each other, right? Because we need to be volume and everything else. So there's a few reasons that we do. That's the self-storage conference, which we're doing up in Coeur d'Alene, right? That is one of the major reasons why it is join us. Come on, let's all do this. Whether you do it on your own or you give me money and you just come with me to do it, which you then own the asset, right? Alongside me, either way, I'm benefiting but so are you. My future is directly correlated with yours. And I do not see a difference in that. Whether you do it on your own or you invest with me, I am directly correlated with your future. If you can't compete, that's not like, I, I tell a lot of people, they're like, oh, well, you're just creating competition. And I'm like, yeah, I hope I'm creating better competition. Because if a storage facility down the street is at 80% occupied and they're lowering rates, that doesn't mean I'm winning. That means I'm failing too. So I can't, if if they're failing, I'm failing. That's not how this market works. I need all of us to be good. I don't want people to overbuild markets. I want people to do good and lift rates, right? So in Coeur d'Alene, we have assets through a whole bunch of the uh, uh, states. We have Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Arizona, Nevada, Oklahoma, Colorado, um, Kansas, on and on. So, but when we go into a lot of these markets, we'll actually buy these facilities. And as we're operating better, the whole market gets better and our operators are making more money. They're, we're getting better products out. And that's really the driving reason. So when I'm putting on an event, you're going to walk away and you're going to say, I'm going to do it myself. And I'm going to say, do it. And here's tools that you can use and the, you use them. And that benefits me. And that benefits you then, or you could say, this is way too complex or too much work, but I still want all the advantages of it or whatever. I just don't want to do it. Then you can give me your money and then we can do it together. Now I benefit because I can buy more. So what I lose in the short term on that equity or that upside, I gain in the long term because I can buy more. So that's how when people partner with me, I'm benefiting from that, right? I'm trying to get to 5 billion. Whereas before I could never do that on my own. It's so hard to scale that high. Um, and, and what you're saying, AJ, real quick, I want to kind of talk about that because we have been to your events, obviously. And that was part of the thing. When I went to your first event, like the light bulb went off in my head. I'm like, not only is a real estate the place to be like, this can all be taken away from you at any second. That's that's what I learned from any second, right? Um, you, you definitely, the way you, you had self-storage was like, wow, I should really do that. I should do that. Um, I'm, the, I'm the least experienced investor in this room, by the way. Uh, Nick kind of got me in probably three years ago and I've got a couple deals, but I haven't done a ton. Um, but yeah, self-storage sounded good when you did it. Right. And then at my head, I'm like, how do I do that? And I can't do that myself. Like, there's, I, I have no idea how to run a self-storage business, AJ. No idea. Right. You're the expert in the industry. And when you said like, oh, you can just get investors and we can just invest together. Like that clicked with me too. Right. But Jeremy, you can raise money. I can. Exactly. You're good at that. Mm -hmm. And you can raise a fund mm -hmm. to invest in AJ's fund. 100%. And once again, that benefits me. Then you're like, oh, well, hey, I can go raise money. I know that you are an expert operator. You've been doing this for 20 years. You have all this infrastructure, which too, a lot of people say, well, okay, AJ, but you know, you, you look at this. I didn't actually want to do that. 
So first of all, you got to understand when I got into the business, we were forced to build an operating company and everything because that option did not exist to us. There was no third party management, right? So a lot of the stuff that we have, we've been building for 15 years out of necessity. It wasn't because we even wanted to. So one of the things though that I don't have, right, is I don't have money, things like that. So then I can partner up with people and everybody can get one of those buckets, right? And then together we can all come in to do a deal. Um, so you're exactly right. Now, those people then want to connect with us from these events. And like, and too, for my, my the events, they're as much education as they are networking. So the Coeur d'Alene event and this one, you know, we the one down in Boise, we put on, and obviously I'm trying to support Idaho. So I'm bringing in people all over the country to Idaho. And I, uh, you know, we, we do it high end. So our Coeur d'Alene event is you borderline obnoxious. I'm just going to say it. it. It is. When I put it on, I was like, this isn't about making money. This isn't about anything else like that. We are going to put on something that everybody walks away and was like, that was insane. Right. We're talking firework shows. We're talking huge outdoor dinners, high-end food, everything. The reason why is I wanted it to be synonymous with my brand and who we are in quality and then the information that is given. And when people walk away from it, they're literally like you guys said, they're like, I've never been to something like that before. And they won't forget it. And they will end up partnering with us. So I do, when we say we put on everything, I do make and have economic incentive to do it because it fuels the underlying business. But I believe I can do that by making it so it's not a, a, a it's it's a long term thing for me. It's not short term. I'm not trying to hawk. There will be nobody going to the back of the room to buy jack at my things. I won't let anybody do it. I say you cannot do that. And that's what that's what's so amazing about your events because I've been to so many so many real estate seminars and I've uh, you know I've been running a, a meetup for uh, almost a decade now and I've seen so many people go to these seminars. They spend you know they don't know jack about real estate, but they get sucked into spending twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars on a program, and then they find out real estate's not for them. They don't even really give it a shot. And and eight and that's eighty ninety percent of them. So you have a eighty ninety percent failure rate and they're making money off the people, not with them. And I feel like you, you are creating an environment where people can make money with you and you're not making money off of them. Was, am I saying that right? Yes. My business model does not make money off people that are learning. It makes money off the thing that we're teaching. That is so different. And I tell everybody, I'm like, I have nothing. I have no problem with education. I have no problem with paying for education, groups, things like that. I do that. I do that. What I have a problem with is when the business is just that. And the business is not correlated with outcomes. That I have a huge issue with. And I look at it and say, if you're if you're going with somebody and they're teaching or doing courses stuff, and over 30% of their income comes from doing that, you should be very, very nervous because you are the product. Yeah. And that's 90% of them out there. Yep. And uh, so it's once again, and two, also because my business is not that, I can't do that because it will absolutely erode away my core business and how I make 100% of my money. That would destroy it, right? Mm -hmm. Because I now I couldn't get investors or not at that level, things like that. So it, it's actually not economical for me to do that whatsoever. Um, and two, I already had my company. I didn't need to. And, and I think, once again, that's kind of the big difference. And I think people feel that. They feel that at our events that like, no, we're actually down in the crowd. We're actually with you talking. Because once again, the reason we're doing it is to make these partnerships and networks. That's why it's not 3,000 people. There's 150 to 300 people. That's it. We cap them. And so it's, I can relate with you so much, man. I mean, because I, I've been doing, I've, I've been putting on events um, monthly for almost a decade here in Coeur d'Alene and we don't charge for it. We're not selling anything. All we're selling is, Hey, when you're ready, we want to be your real estate agents and we've done it before. We could show you how. And, and it's just, it's incredible. It's incredible. The amount of leads that we get and how uh, the, the relationships are just so much easier to build that way. They're not cold. Exactly. And you now, long-term games, long-term people, quality, um, 
you know, I, 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 I do have a different approach, everything. I've been in doing this for almost 20 years now. I don't expect anything to turn around. It's like, you know, we went through 2008. We had assets. We didn't lose any. We didn't go bankrupt. Our, our, our system, our model is very much predicated around long-term things. And I hedge against short-term risk and volatility. And short-term things are actually opportunities for us. I mean, right now, we have our uh, Fund2 portfolio, which is all all deals that we have been working on for some of these over a year. This is seller finance deals. These are off-market opportunities. This stuff is hard. This is not like you just go to a realtor and get this deal. I can't, right? And so when we're looking at like short-term volatility things, we're, we're taking advantage of that and we're getting these amazing deals. But it took us it took us years to even get to a point where we could get those amazing deals. And I learned that from the last one and from this one now and how we do things. It's, I don't do anything under a five-year uh, uh, vision and I don't plan on ever having an asset under 10 years. I just, I, I can't because I know what happens and I've seen all the cycles. I understand them. I know how these assets perform. And I know that the difference between, you know, what I call extrinsic value and intrinsic value is an extrinsic trap or a value trap that I call it. And short-term thinking and short-term games, they get caught in value traps. A lot of people don't understand. Almost all the deals that you see that fail, the deal didn't fail. The investor failed, meaning that the, the deal actually made the exact same amount of money. So when they say, well, it lost all its value. I say, oh, it stopped making money. Oh, no, 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 no. It still made the exact same amount of money. And it's like, oh, okay. So actually the asset was perfectly fine, right? And they say, yeah, but there just wasn't as many investors. So the price went down. Well, what does that have anything to do with the price? That's an extrinsic thing. That's not real value, right? And in real estate, how people think about it is like gambling. And it's like a stock. The price goes up and down and I make money. Why? Because the market makes it more valuable. Well, that was something that I didn't understand nor believe in when I started and 2008 confirmed it. And I don't believe in, I believe in efficient market theory over the long term, but not the short term. In the short term, markets are radically inefficient. And so when we look at it, we say these value traps that people get caught in because the price changed, even though the asset was making more money. I can't tell you how many people, their asset is making more money than it was two years ago, and now they're going to lose it. How is that possible? Your business makes more money and you're going to lose it, right? Why? Because, well, I have to refinance or I have to sell. And now, because there's not as many investors, I can't sell it for as much or I can't refinance it as much. And so the value lost. Those are games that I specialize in not playing. So like our, our, our debt, our first debt, we're talking 2030 is when our debt comes due. Why? Because we, we have time and, uh, is our hedge against those short-term market fluctuations. That means in that time, I choose when I'm going to refinance. I choose what I'm going to sell. And then I work on all intrinsic value. It's all we care about. The revenue is X. How do we make the revenue X? And can we measure that? Can we see that? If we can, we buy it, lock in long-term value for a decade, right? So we don't ever have to care. And then we try for three to six years um, to get what we could measure. We just extract it. I call it money on the table. I'm taking it off. And we, when we're looking at a deal, we can actually measure that. That's something I can measure. Intrinsic, I can measure. I don't know what the market's going to do. And I don't care. And that's the, that's our whole entire business model. Yeah. Can, can we talk a little bit, a little, uh, about how, how are you able to successfully be vertically integrated? Because I got to tell you, I tried, um, it's really hard. I mean, I, I, I sold real estate for, uh, eight, eight or nine years before I started trying to step it up and start uh, doing other things, um, brought on, uh, started a media company for all of our photos and tried to service other agents, started a construction company because we were flipping houses anyway, might as well do that and be an owner of that. And, uh, and then it just, it just started to become a mess and I couldn't focus on one thing, constant distractions all day long. And eventually I found myself in $11 million in debt and, um, negative, probably 60 grand a month and just couldn't get anything done and uh, almost wiped me out completely. Um, I'm recovering from that. I'm, I'm not going bankrupt. I still get to keep my Tesla. 
but holy shit, trying to vertically integrate is not for everybody. So tell me, how are you able to figure that out? So I've, a- I've been able to figure it out because I had so, so many screw ups in the past. That's how, first of all. So these are lessons that, and when I'm talking about a lot of this stuff, uh, you have to understand that behind the words are scars that I learned, right? I can feel that. Uh huh. And I've I've grown too fast, and that almost burned me. I've added too much, and I almost lost everything in 2010 on the insurance side because I tried to vertically integrate and grow too fast. Um, so what those mistakes have taught me, and what I learned is that first of all. There has to be an organic supportive nature of it. Now, when we like, we're we're very vertically integrated. So, we uh, we talked about those companies. What I didn't mention is I have an architecture company, I have a debt brokerage firm, I have a construction management firm, I have a feasibility consulting company. Um, on top of all those other things that we'd already mentioned. Now, the when I started, I didn't have any of that crap. The only thing we had was we would buy a deal. And then we had to manage it because that wasn't an option. That didn't exist for us, right? But nothing outside that. We didn't do development. We didn't do anything. 10 years later, we did our first development. That was in 2013. Uh, no, 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 15. And uh, that was after we'd been in the game for a long time. And so we were scared of risk. I'm very conservative. And so we didn't ever develop. And then um, we did in 2015 because of certain reasons, which we can talk about that later if we want. But what we started to do is at a certain point, our assets and our business itself was actually, it was too expensive to go outside. So what we found is, oh, so like I have all my own attorneys. Well, we are paying $800,000 a year to an attorney firm. Well, why don't we just go get the best attorney possible and bring them in? And then we just saved huge amounts of money, right? So we did two things. First of all, we needed to support the vert- the vertical integration. And we also, uh, as far as our ability, like our actual cash flows, okay? The second thing is we also needed to be able to support it in infrastructure. So the vast majority of the businesses that I'm talking about, we've only had in the last three years, uh, so the first one started with the co-op, right? Things like that, which that had its own infrastructure and we could base it around it. Our tech company is not could based I, could here. Could I pause you real quick? Yeah, please do. I want to say, I, I think you actually did a third thing too that most people don't do is it seemed like you, uh, you had a full understanding of your numbers and you tracked things. Um, not every not every business owner knows that, oh, I spent 800 grand in legal fees over the last year. Like not not everybody knows what they spend money on. But but if they had a real clear understanding of what they're actually spending money on, then then you can identify those opportunities, 100%. right? One hundred percent. We're identifying ROI on expenses, just not just investments, and we treat it like a business. So we don't go, oh, we're buying an asset and it's going to make us money. Like most people, how they invest is they literally what they do is they save up money, they buy an investment, that investment makes cash flow, and then they just try to minimize the expense and then they maximize the investment, right? The investment is a product that's supposed to give them money. I don't view it like that. The investment is a product in which my business owns and sells, okay? So I have a business that does this. That business, then we look at it and see how are we growing? What's our ROI? What are the expenses? How are we building out in the long term? What's that written? What's the infrastructure that we need? And we can systematically build the business to operate these investments that we own, to run these investments, to make sure that these investments are growing systematically. So when I say like measuring from when we find it, I don't go and buy an asset and hope that the market makes it more. When when we buy an asset, we look and say, how much money can it make today because it's not being run like a business? So that that upside is measurable. If the market makes it more, great. That's how we operate our businesses. So when we're vertically integrating, um, it looks like, so some people may look at it and be like, man, AJ, you're all over the place. And the truth is I'm not at all. I'm very outrageously focused. My tech company that's out of Southern California as a CEO, it has a team, it has everything else like that, right? Um, I'm the largest investor. I sit on the board of it and we're the founding members. We started it from our co-op and the same with the other. I don't, it's, I'm not all over the place. 
Yeah, it sounds like what you've done is like you've you've had a really good understanding of what your business expenses are and you're trying to control those. Yes. And two, it's all in my core competencies. So this is one thing that people look at. You may see it as separate businesses. They're they're not though. Construction management, storage, architecture, storage, and things that we do. So we have to have it anyways. But two, this is the big thing. I get my construction management team, my architecture team, my feasibility uh, team, we get our attorney, we get our debt brokerage team, then we get our private equity team. We all sit down at a table when a deal comes across and we look at the deal. And then I have all of those people that other people either have to farm out or they have to ask or they don't even ask. And we look at that deal and we find the upside, we find the downsides. So all of a sudden, once again, we're doing the exact same thing. We're just better at it from it. It doesn't take away, it adds. Um, yeah, that's awesome, man. So obviously going in that, and obviously, like you said, like you're not all over the place. What I think you are is you're intentional with your business, right? Very intentional. Right. You're so intentional with it. Like you're, you're planning ahead for these things. And when you plan ahead for them, you're just, you're getting the pieces that you need in order to be successful in business, right? Because you are running it like a business. So it's, it's, it's awesome. And you know, from an outsider's perspective, like you said, it might seem like you're all over the place, but I'd, I'd wager you're one of the most smart guys in the business in the industry doing this. So props well, to you on you. that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I, I think, you know, I don't know about smart, but I look at it differently and I, how I actually in the industry, how I started to, I think maybe not get fame or anything, but just people started taking notice was in the early, like 2015, um, I was asked to speak cause I'd been talking to a bunch of people and I, I spoke at an event and the name of my title was, um, self storage is a business. It's not a real estate investment. And that just, people were like, what, what are you talking about? Right? Like, Hey, it was like, and so I kind of gained this notoriety because I said things like, you know, it's not a real estate investment. It's a business. Then I'd also say things like occupancy doesn't matter. And it was just contrary to how everybody thought. And then what I would do is I would show case studies. So I would actually break down and show why and how. And all of a sudden, people took notice. They wanted to know more about what was going on and what it's doing. So it wasn't even that I was smart, but we looked at it differently, which was right. And that now that's how the whole industry starts to operate. And they all look at it like that. And that's why my book did so well. So I wrote a book and literally it was how to turn a real estate asset into a thriving business. That's the whole, that was the whole premise of it. And I wrote it. I didn't even think anybody honestly would care. I, I, I self published it and it just went nuts and it went like wildfire. And I think it was cause I answered so many questions that people had. And obviously I give everything away. Um, but also we are looking at it right. And the numbers speak for themselves. So it, you're, you're right. When we just look at it differently, I came from a business background, not a real estate investment background. Cash flow, right? That's why we survived 2008. It wasn't because we were smart real estate investors. It's because we weren't real estate investors. Got it. I love it. And real quick, AJ, I want to talk about your dad too, because your dad, he's smart as a whip too. Like I love listening to him talk. Um, last year at the CRE event, he talked about just, you know, the the people who are investing in storage units and the people who are using storage units. He broke it all down for everybody. And that stuff, like, again, as an outsider, like I would never think of like, are they mostly females? Are they mostly males? Like what age are they in? Like, who are these people investing? So, you know, you have those statistics and you can really like laser focus on in what works and what amenities they want in a storage unit. They're customers and we're servicing our customers. I, I mean, I, it, it could go, you, you know, people that if anybody's ever been on my, I, I host every other week I do webinars that are uh, uh, free and open and we break down to everything we look at. I look at the consumer purchases that people are making when I'm going to buy uh, storage facilities in their market. We look at everything. I'm looking at income, houses. I'm looking at all sorts of stuff because I want to know our customer. And people just don't look at it like that. And that's, you know, I, I don't want to gamble. I want to know and I want to measure. And so you're right. We look at things and we analyze things constantly. I'm obsessed with information and data and our revenue management systems are so high end and nobody, like we literally have a revenue management system that not one person in the industry, not even the REITs do. 
And it shows our fund one that we had last year. So get this, our fund one that we rolled out last year, uh, 80% of that uh, fund one was in a market where the rates in that market went down like 40%. In some cases, they went down like 65%, the rates did in that market. Our fund one is up over 55% in revenue, gross revenue, total. It, it, it's it's up. And that's and peop, it, it's like, why? Because I'm not, the market's not going to dictate that shape. We know exactly who we're trying to get. We know where they live. Um, and that level is not how we started. When we started out, it was, I, I, I laugh about this because people are like, oh, well, you knew all this. So of course you're successful. I'm like, you want to know my business model when we started? It was this. And my first, uh, our, my first facility was in Bonners Ferry, Idaho, everybody. So, uh, you know, I, when our model was this, make sure people pay their bills, make sure that people can, um, uh, uh, find us. Right. So it was like, know that we're there. And then answer the phone if people call. That's it. That was our business model. That's a pretty simple business, but effective at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> and it did really, really well. And we would find assets, though, that weren't doing that. Simple. Find an assets that doesn't do this very good. We're just going to do it a little better. And that was our business model. Now, today, that same exact thing is what we do. We just do it 100 miles deep. Oh, sure. You're scaled at such a level that you know you can do it that level for sure. Oh, I wanted to ask before we jump on to a different topic, but um, it seems like with, when it comes to technology, you're kind of light years ahead of most of your competition. Are you yet utilizing um, AI or chat GBT for anything that you're currently working on? We do. In fact, I'm building an AI company. So I'm building um, out AI specific things to, um, I can't fully roll it out yet, but our AI analysis um, in combination with everything from revenue management, market analysis and, uh, uh, done. So we do, we use AI. Um, we are implementing the AI as well as some other technology into the self-service models for storage facilities to drop down cost. Um, if, listen, here's, here's the truth. If you're not using AI, it, People that say AI is not that big of a deal are the same people that said the internet wasn't that big of a deal. At the end of the day, if you are not on the internet and you're a storage facility today, if you had to buy it or build it today, you will lose your money. You'll lose your shirt. You could not be on the internet and be a storage facility if you built 20 years ago at a pennies so you didn't, don't have any cost. But today, if you bought or you built a storage facility and you're not online, you you will fail. You won't exist. That is going to be the same thing with AI. I feel like uh, I'm so glad you're in my camp here because everybody I work around, I, all my coworkers, they all think I'm insane because I use AI too much or I use ChatGPT too much. I use it for everything and they just think I'm just this weirdo and it's just a fad. But I it, I don't think they they don't understand how powerful it is. Well, a lot of people, so a lot of people are have have learned so much about like BlackRock, right? And how BlackRock owns trillions of dollars and they own all the companies, everything else. And people are waking up to this going, this is terrifying because we have one company that owns basically everything. Every single major, they're on the boards of every single company. And this is just starting to get out. This company that owns $3 trillion, they are bigger than like every country in the world except America. And when people are like, how did this happen or whatnot? What they don't realize is that they created AI in 2014 called Aladdin. And that AI is what helps them do all their analysis, every, everything. Aladdin is the entire brain of that company. And now you have to remember, that was in 2014. So think about what, first of all, the government and companies are using today. And these big companies, the only reason you think that it's not a big deal, things like that, is I'm telling you, you just don't know how it's being used and what and where. But there is no part of our lives that will not be touched by AI. Right now, I, I'm willing to say that probably 60% of every normal person's daily life is in some way, shape, or form being connected and uh, has some kind of end touch point with AI. They just don't know or see it or understand it. And so for businesses, 
it's not just a thing about being cutting edge. That's not it. It's a thing about cost and operations. You will not be able to operate a business without AI because the markets won't allow you to because you won't have enough profit or enough margin. Um, we're already seeing that. I mean, you have funds now that are doing with five people what took 20 people just three years ago. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty hard. It's hard for a lot of people to wrap their heads around it because they just don't know. <laughs> yes. And we're, we're, the only reason people know is because chat GPT put the first consumer product out, right? Um, and I mean, the things we're doing with AI is essentially, and I can just tell you this, we're trying to basically remove people because we know that's going to happen. It, so it's, I, I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing stuff. And um, is it scary? It's terrifying. I, 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 it is terrifying. And I just know though, that if we don't do it, we won't be in business. So we have to. So whether it's terrifying or not is irrelevant because it's the same thing like, you know, saying this internet's not a big deal and our business isn't going to get uh, get in on this or, or be a part of it. Yeah. Only thing I tell with Nick with uh, chat GPT is I'm like, just make sure you say thank you to it after every time because when the computer started to assimilate us, I want to be on the same page as them. So. <laughs> It has a deep memory bank. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, so if for anyone listening real quick, I just want to just kind of circle back to investing with AJ. Like you've heard him talk here on the podcast with us. Uh, you've, you've heard how much he, he cares and loves his product and he cares about his people he invests with. Like if, if that's not a reason enough to like reach out to invest with you, I don't know what it is because again, you're the leader in the industry, AJ, and it's awesome talking with you about it. So thank you for being here with that. Thank you guys for having me on it. it like I, 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 and I mentioned to you guys this before guys, I'm a sixth generation Idahoan. I come from family. My father grew up in extreme poverty, not like poverty. We know today he had an outhouse, he poached for food and he sold firewood. This is more like poverty that we saw back in like the thirties, right? Uh, 1930s. And we, um, you know, when we look at that, uh, that kind of poverty, my dad's not old. And so this was not like, oh yeah, well, of course, you know, he's 90 years old. No, he's not. My dad was, you know, a seventies child. This is, he's not old. Um, and so when we look at the, you know, his background, my mom is a farm girl. My family are farmers. They're all farmers from Southern Idaho. And my dad tried to get out of poverty and he started selling insurance and he moved us to, at the time, was the big city of, uh, well, Meridian. I, I hunted out my backyard, but um, it was, I still, my cousins and family called me a city slicker. But I, you know, I can't tell you how important this place is to me. It's in every fiber of my being and who I am. And we're trying really hard to support it. And just the nature of the business and how it works is the vast majority of all my investors, the vast majority of partners and stuff are not here. They're not local. And that's something we're trying to change. And I really appreciate you guys giving me a platform up there in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I know a lot of your listeners are from around there. And I'm trying to make sure that we bring to Idaho the exact same opportunities. You know, I have a podcast called Saving Capitalism. I'm really big on this. And the best way to save capitalism is to get people to participate in it. And I'm trying to build a company that allows people to have access to the growing economy and world that they're not getting left behind because your money doesn't work. Your money in a bank account loses every single year. You're literally falling behind. So I don't even think that it's like, oh, it's a good thing. I think it's necessary. I think it has to be mandatory. And the options that we've been given have been so institutionalized from Wall Street and watered down because everybody takes it. So now you're hoping that you can put your stuff in a stock market, get a 7% return. You just can't win. And it's like, we got to get people really back in the economy like they used to be like people that actively owned and actively participated. They had their own land. They sold their own food. And we've got to get back and we got to let people participate in this new world we're in because it's not going back. Yeah. And when you mentioned opportunities, it, it kind of brought me back to, I, I remember listening to a podcast that you did on Bigger Pockets. I think it was the second time you were on there, but you said something about opportunity that almost like gave me chills. Um, I don't know if you remember it, but you, you mentioned that opportunity um, becomes more and more apparent uh, the more knowledge you gain. 
And um, I feel like it's really important for people if they feel like they, there's just no opportunity out there right now, they just don't know enough. Yep. And if they can just you know come to your event or just get more educated, get more involved. You, I've I've personally witnessed you know once you get to a point where you just you keep learning and learning about real estate and business, the opportunities are everywhere, all over the planet. Uh, the only problem you're going to have is like, what are you going to pick that's not going to waste your time? You know. <laughs> And, and two, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, my wife started a school around finance and, and everything for kids, and it's the first business private school in the state of Idaho. Um, but you're, you're exactly right. And two, I remember, I, I remember, like, obviously, you know, go back to 2008, all the opportunity that was there that we could have taken advantage of that I didn't know and other people didn't know. The opportunities are there. They're everywhere. They're, and, but just because they're there doesn't mean it's easy. But they're there, but most people, our school systems failed us. We don't know anything about economics. We don't know anything about stuff. So they don't even know the basics to see the opportunities. And two, because they don't even know the basics and thing, it scares people. And sometimes they even know an opportunity, but then they don't take advantage of it because they think, well, I can't either really know it. I'm probably wrong, right? Even if it's the simplest, most basic one. And that is a failure of the educational system. The only way to get around it is through education. You're 100% right. Yeah. Yeah, because then it becomes a problem of not where am I going to spend money. It's like where am I going to spend my time. Um, that that's the problem that a lot of people with a lot of knowledge eventually have is like where am I going to where am I going to allocate my time? It's not about money anymore. Exactly, you're one hundred percent right. Well, thank you, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, we're not we're not quite done yet. By the way, I'm going to get through a wind down question. By the way, real oh, quick, sorry. just about five more minutes. Uh, but I do just want to. Do you have time for five more minutes? Cool. Um, so real quick, I just want to plug the self storage event one more time in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, September 26th through 29th. It is in the fall of September 2023. AJ, how can people get a hold of you or get tickets to the event? Self storage income. Um, go ahead and, and go there and to even email in, I, I'll, I'm going to make a discount for locals. So I'll tell my team right now. Oh, we have one. In, oh, good. Perfect. Um, it, good. yeah. If, if they type in, uh, N I R E I, they'll get a hundred dollars off. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we'll put that in the description, but yeah, if you go, go sign up on the self storage income site, I believe it is. Yes. Um, yeah. N I for North Idaho, R E I you'll get a hundred bucks off. Awesome. And then real quick, like I said, what we typically do, AJ, is I just do a wind down with, uh, just get you a couple predetermined questions we talk about. Um, if you had one business or investing book, you recommend every single investor read, what would that be? The Warren Buffett way. Oh, okay. I love it. The Warren Buffett way. Uh, the next question is, if you were gifted $30 million to one of your bank accounts, what's the first thing you'd spend it on? Um, the first thing I would spend on uh, $30 million today would be uh, commercial real estate distressed properties. I love it. I figured you would say that, but I just wanted to hear you say it anyway. <laughs> what are you going to buy with it? You're going to go invest with it more. You're going to buy the thing. You 100%. Know, of course. Yep. <laughs> um, next question is, what advice would you give to a newer investor looking to maybe get started on their first or second deal? Um, so the first, the first thing I'd get is um, long-term. And uh, I... I the one thing I worry about is people listen to this podcast, things like that. And if anything, they hear me and it's discouraging because they feel like they don't know so much and everything. Um, but you have to remember that's not how it started out. And that's not how we were. In fact, we went into an asset class that nobody knew much about. There was no podcast. There was no books. You're already a million light years ahead of me or, or anybody that is my age or was starting out then. And you do just need to get started. So cover your short-term risks, long-term investing, and get started. I love it. That's all you have to do. Take action, get started. That's that's the easiest way to do it. Just jump in. Um, next question is, how do you define success? Progress. Um, I, I, a lot of people, I think, will either put numbers on it or say something. At the end of the day, success is that I'm better next le next year than I was this year. I'm better. I'm a better husband. I'm a better father. I'm a better service in my community, my church. I'm better at investing. I'm better at protecting people's money. It's progress. That's success. It's just that I'm better next year than I was this year. I love that. I always say I'm looking for progress, not perfection. 
hundred percent. Right. We're looking to get better, but we're not looking to be that perfect because I think perfection is a, it's an unattainable idea, right? Like we, we can try to be perfect all we want, but as long as we're trying our best and trying our best to be good dads and good family members and good friends and good people in our community, like that, that's good. That's enough. Uh, next question for you is where can people find out more about investing with you? Yeah, you can go to Cedar Creek Capital uh, dot com and go there and yep, we got our hats there and uh you can go check out um uh, everything's on there you can go to invest with me but you more importantly you can just reach out um so you can send a message um right there and our team will will, will jump on and they'll, they'll work with you and, and help you out with any information or anything you might might like awesome uh aj any uh final closing thoughts you'd like to add for the podcast uh, no, I just looking forward to see you guys up in uh, Coeur d'Alene. I'm excited to be back up there. We got a, uh, my dad bought a house a long time ago up there that we go and now uses like a family thing up in uh, Cougar Gulch. And so we, uh, we, I've been going up to Coeur d'Alene since I was a kid. That's why we hold the events up there and everything. We love, we love it up there. So I'm just excited to see you guys up there and everybody else come. Um, and please, if you come to the event, stop me, let's talk and, uh, let me know that you heard me on this podcast here. Um, I love to meet with you guys, everybody that's there and talk about that's the reason why it's small. I love it. That's good stuff. Nick, uh, take us home, buddy. Well, AJ, we appreciate what you do. Thank you so much for coming on this small time podcast. We appreciate it. We know your time is super valuable and it's Monday morning. It's probably the worst time ever to have a podcast. Yeah, we do it anyway, though. <laughs> it's on the schedule. It gets done. So I, like I told you guys, I'm headed out for uh, two weeks in, uh, to Canada to take my 13 year old son who just turned 13. When they when they become a teenager, I take them on this like epic trip that has to be like, no, it has to be hard. It has to be rough. So we're doing back country. We're going to go, uh, hunt, uh, caribou, which I'm not a hunter, but that's what he wanted to do. So I'm like, I'll have to learn and figure it out. And I, I'm leaving tomorrow morning. And so I wanted to make sure we did this and I got on and got to, um, do this with you guys this morning. So I, I appreciate your accommodations and everything and, and making this all work. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thanks so much for being here and, uh, we'll see you uh, down the road. Yes. Everybody look at the description, sign up for the seminar. We'll see you there. Thanks guys. See you next week. Thank you so much for checking out the Investor Shed podcast. If you enjoyed your time, make sure to leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Follow along on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram at The Investor Shed for shorts and promos about each episode. Do you want to be a guest or know someone who has great real estate investing advice and stories? Reach out to us at theinvestorshed at gmail.com.